going to be going a little more likely to make mistakes. But uh, one thing I wanted to show you now, uh, I, I've since renamed these things to foot controller one, two, three, and so on. Um, so I'll just do the parenting that I need to do, which means, so this one is already the parent, so I need to make reverse foot toe and its children the child of foot controller. Here, so I'll just do that, set their name properly, which who knows, maybe make sure I'm doing it right. Looks good so far. So just middle mouse dragging. Yep. Um, when you move the nose circles, how do you, well, what's the command for uh, slapping them to uh, the, the grid? The, well, like some of them are in the middle of. The oh, well, in, in, my case, in this case, I just made one and snapped it here, and then I duplicated it using that same right. revolve. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to snap something to a joint, you can do that too. It works on the same as a vertex snap. So if you hold down V and middle mouse, it will snap to the middle of the joint. But it's a little imprecise because it might want to snap to you know, the IK, which is also in the middle, but um, you know, the way I did it was just by duplicating it. So now I've got these all set up. So I should, in theory, be able to... <laughs> oh, I didn't do any of the other parenting. Um, so I've got to make the IK handles the children of the feet. So, of course, I didn't label in. Let me just go through and do this quickly. It's possible. I don't have enough screen real estate here to have everything on at the same time. So, I've got my ankle uh, things are are labeled, so I can just make my IKs, the IKs that are controlling the legs, the children of the reverse foot. So the IK ankle for B1 should be the, the child of reverse foot ankle for number one. IK ankle, little scroll wheel, too sensitive. Uh, for B2, this one, three to three. Four, four, and five to five. And then the IKs of the toes, and now this is what I didn't label, unfortunately. I've done one already, but this one is toe B1, so I can drag that onto reverse foot toe one. So this is two, so that should be the child of reverse foot toe two, and on and on like Voltron. So that's three, It's a bit tedious, but if you get, if you take the time to go through all this, it just makes life easier later on. Four and this should be the last one. Five. And drag that to toe five. Reverse foot toe five. So now I grab any of these controllers. Oops, see, I did make a mistake. Whoa. And I failed the class too. Uh, oh, dragged it. So now if I grab any of these foot controllers, everything works. So let's say we want to add one more level of control over this. And this would be equivalent if you're doing a biped of 
of a toe roll or a, a, a ball roll. So when, when you're doing walk like this, you do a heel strike, and then you roll onto the ball with your foot, and you roll on the ball, and you do the toe walk. So you might want to add some extra control for rolling on the ball of the foot. So let's look at this one here. So if I take this controller and I want to rotate it so we pivot right on the toe, because if I move this normally, you can see it's moving but it's bending here on the ankle. If I rotate here, you can see I can also pivot on the tip of the toe, which might be useful, I don't know. So if I wanted to control that, I could simply rotate this circle and do that, but I might want to add um, a separate controller for that. So I'm going to add an attribute to this foot controller. And I'll just do it on one because it's not that important, but just to demonstrate how this works. So I'll select the circle and I'll open the attribute editor. And I'm going to add a new attribute. And I'm going to call this, uh, which controller is this? is number three. So FC3 toe roll. And so I'm not making a working attribute yet. I'm just creating an empty attribute that I can add values to later. So the minimum would be zero, so it's, it's standard pose. One will be the maximum. And then zero will be the default value. So it will be that way when we start. Just say OK. And so we should see in the extra attributes here now toe roll. So if I change it, nothing happens. So this is another aspect of rigging, connecting one value to another attribute so you can control it from a different location. And you do this by uh, using a function called setDrivenKey. Now we know what setting keys are, but setDrivenKey means you're keying one thing and it drives the attribute of another. So in this case, we want this attribute that we just created to drive the rotation of that circle. And it doesn't have to be the circle. We could actually do it on the uh, joint itself. So let me just select my, oops. <coughs> OK. Um, so I want to select my joint here. So if I select the joint, I can rotate this. And that way, the circle doesn't rotate, so it always stays up. So I've got my toe joint here. So I'm going to, just for ease, I'm going to copy this tab. So even if I deselect it, I'll still have this attribute tab open. So I want to, what attribute is it that I want to change on here? Let's see. So I'll select this, and if I rotate it, it looks like it's rotation in Z. So I can right click on this, and instead of set key, I can do set driven key. Whoops. So by default, it's 90. So I'm going to set a driven key. And so it opens up this option box now. Thinking about it, I'm not sure if it's best to do this on the joint or on the circle, but I'll just do it on the joint for now. Um, so the driven attribute is the toes rotate Z. So now I have to load the driver. The driver will be the circle. Oops. Will be the circle. So I can click here, load driver. And toe roll will be my, that attribute that I created earlier will be my driver attribute. And so with toe roll at zero and this thing not rotated at all, beyond its standard, I can just key the value. And you can see up here there's a key in here now. So if I change this value, so I'll select this, and I'll rotate it, let's say, that's maybe that's the maximum, let's say 45 degrees is the maximum I want to go. Oops, I've got to go back to 90 degrees. Um, before I do that, I've actually got to change this attribute, the toe roll. So let me find that's very landing in space. So I'll select the circle. 
and I'll change tone roll to one. And then I'll change the rotation of the joint. So I'll select this joint. And I'll rotate it, let's say, to 45 degrees. And I'll key it again. So now, if we go back to the circle, I've got an attribute that controls this separately. Now, whether this is useful or not, I don't know. Um, and I can, I can actually foresee some problems that this would cause. Like, for example, if I now took this circle and moved it up and rotated it, I would get sort of a double rotation that could cause some problems. It actually seems to be functioning all right. But now I can, if I wanted to control the way this landed on the surface, just gives me a little extra control. But this is a way you can do this for any kind of rig where you need to centralize the control. You can attach it to one of these uh, objects like the circle that we created in the Rooms curve. So the last step was to set the key, not to use set driven key again. Yeah, so once you have the set driven key window open, you use the key button down oh. here to do it. So you want to set it first at zero value here for toe roll and then change it or leave it at whatever rotation in Z you want, key, then change the toe roll to its maximum value, which is one, and then change the rotation in Z to whatever you want. It will map that rotation to one in this value, and then key. And then you've got a curve between the two. Now, because this is these are keys, you can actually always look at this in the um, graph editor, too. So if I select that curve. Now, there's a key here on rotate Z and oh, maybe I'm looking at the wrong thing. Yeah, so this is the value that it goes to from zero uh, to one. So you could change this here too if you wanted to be go through a more complicated animation, something like that. You can add keys and so on. Okay, so I'm just going to leave that alone. You can do that for whatever you want, although it might get a little complicated with things that are rotating on slight, on more than one axis. Now let's see, like if we take this one for example, that's Toby, not Toby. Um, outliner. So that's this one. So you can see that's not rotating along the object's axis. And uh, you could run into some problems if I, if I took the reverse foot toe. Oh, it's, well, it's lined up along its own axis, so it would work. But anyway, just to give you an idea. So the next thing I want to do is to make a rig for the spine. And we're going to use a spine, a spline IK. We remember we did this before when we were doing the, the nephron and the loop of Henle, that little exercise we did last term when we used it to help model along a curve and deform an object along a curve. We're going to do the same thing here to use a curve to deform this um, joint system here. Not the whole thing, not right down to the root, but from uh, spine B all the way up to spine B5, which the head is parented to. So let me just show you what this does. I'll just create a quick curve. Now you can auto-create this curve when you set up the spline IK, spline IK, but I'll create my own. So I'm just going to snap some curve points uh, right where the joints are, which are already at my grid intersection. So I'll just snap to grid here. So I've created a new CV curve. I'm going to rename this one non dynamic curve B. So now what I want to do is um, create a spline IK. So if we look here under skeleton, before we were using IK handle tool, now we want to use the IK spline handle tool. And this is useful for doing things like 
um, a tail or a backbone or um, a fish if you wanted to wiggle while you animated swimming through the water or something like that. So click on this and it gives you some instructions down here. Uh, choose the starting joint, in our case it would be the one, not the root, but the first spine. So we'll select that. And then the last joint in the chain, which will be this one. And then it says select the curve. Now, oh, aha, uh -huh, never mind. Let me go back and do that again. I forgot to change one of the settings. So we created our curve already. So I'll click on spline IK. And if you look in the tool settings here, root on curve, auto pair curve, auto create curve. We don't want that. We've got our own curve. So we're going to delete that. Turn off auto parent curve. Turn off root on curve. Just turn off everything. And now we follow the instructions and it will say select the first joint. Oops, yes. Select. It's a little tricky to get into the right spot. So that one and the end joint. And now it says select your curve. So I think if I just go like this, it won't work. So we have to turn off joint selection and that won't work either. Try this again. Can you select the outliner or you have to keep that? Yeah, uh, I'll try this. I'll try that. Let's see if it'll work. Yeah. Okay. How did I do this before? Show. Where's my curve? Oh, there it is. It's actually there. Okay, right. one more time. The feeling. I'm just going to turn off joints and see if I can do it that way. I'll edit this part out. What am I doing differently when this always comes so easily? Usually. Star joint. End joint. Pick the curve for the handle. Let me try that again in the outliner. Super close. There it goes. Hey, hey, hey. So, I just deselected joint selection, and now I've I've gone into component mode for the curve. So I can select um, CVs, and if I if I deform the curve, the joint system will follow. And if I make the the curve too long, you can see it tries to follow as much of the curve as it can. So we could use this to animate this. Normally what you would do is each one of these uh, CVs, because it's a pain to select, you would turn them into a cluster. So if we turn each one into a cluster and turn on relative mode, I think, all that essentially does, you can see, it's hard to see, there's a little C here. It makes a transform node for the components you've selected. So you can select 10 CVs or whatever and make a single cluster and it allows you to select that transform node and move them around and they will follow and you can animate their position. So instead of selecting the CV, I can select that cluster. So that's normally how you would do something like that. But what we're going to do is a little different. I'm going to undo out of that get rid of that IK handle. What we want to do is to create a curve that's dynamic, that when we move the whole skeleton around, the sort of neck will lag behind and you'll get some secondary motion when it stops and things like that. Now, we're probably straying from the way real molecular mechanisms like this actually work, but remember animation is about communication. It's not always about simulation and 
actual replication. So we still have our curve in there. I don't have that IK handle anymore. Um, so before we create the IK, we're going to make this curve dynamic. So we're going to stray into hair a little bit right now, and we'll talk about hair a little bit more later on, but for now, we'll talk about it in terms of how it can help us rig. So in our menu set, we have all n particles, n mesh, and all this stuff. We also have n hair. And the command that we want is make selected curves dynamic. I'm just going to open up the option box for this. You can see I have my curve selected here. That was under edit curves? It's under n curves. N. Yeah, it's in the n dynamics section. So if we look at it up here in the uh, modules at the upper left, if we switch to n dynamics, we'd find n hair. Here. Make selected curves dynamic. So the output that we want for this are NURBS curves, and we can turn off attached curves to selected surfaces. It doesn't really matter. We don't have a, a surface selected, so it wouldn't make a difference, but turn it off anyway, and simply click Make Curves Dynamic. So a whole bunch of stuff has been added to our shot here, or to our scene. So let's look at these. Oops. So here's all our foot controllers and stuff, and we created, made that her, hair curve dynamic, which has added a hair system shape to our scene, which controls the quality of that hair, how stiff it is, how uh, resistant to deformation is, and so on. We've got this new thing called hair follicles, and remember we looked at follicles for, before for attaching objects to surfaces, and you can see that our thing that I had called non-dynamic curve before is gone. It's actually inside here. It's attached to the follicle that was just created. So if we, you know, Maya's metaphor, follicles and hair, so the follicle is what the hair springs from. Um, so the original curve is the child of the follicle. And then this other thing has been created called the hair system output curves. And so here's our new dynamic curve. So I'm going to name it dynamic curve, just so we don't lose track. And one other thing has been created, although in my case it was created earlier because I've created more than one hair in the scene, but a nucleus node. So it's an N hair, so it, it exists in the nucleus universe. So we have a nucleus node here, which, remember, controls the nature of the environment, gravity, wind speed, things like that. But what we want to do is use this dynamic curve to be this, the controller of that spline IK that we created before, but we'll create a new one. So let me just play the animation, because I have my scene set to play every frame, which you have to, because now we're dealing with dynamic systems. But I have mine locked to, uh, to try and play it back at 30 frames per second, even though it is playing every frame. Uh, the reason I, you could put it to free, which is, might be okay for these computers. I know my computer at home, it's, it's more, it's newer than these computers, so it solves it way faster and it goes by too quickly. So if you have to lock it to a slower speed. Um, and if we look at the nucleus node here, I set this earlier, but nucleus. If we open up the attribute editor. I turned up some wind speed in here because I want it to knock my hair over so I can see it. So we'll play the animation and see if anything happens. Nope, nothing. That's because we have to change one thing first before we do this. So let's look at the hair a little bit. Now we're going to look in the follicle node. This is where some of the initial settings for the hair are. So follicle shape. Remember we looked at this before, the parameter u and v for uh, finding out where it exists on the surface. This isn't attached to a surface, so it's got no u and v location. But what's important here is point lock. This means that both ends of the hair are locked. They won't move. The middle part of the hair will move, 
but both ends are locked right now. We just want it locked at the base, where it's connected to the base of our spine here, and we want the top part to be free so it can wiggle around. So we can say point lock at the base. That's all. So now if we play the animation, hopefully, let's see, maybe we're looking at it from the wrong direction. Okay, I see nothing. Let's select our dynamic curve. Okay. Bear with me. Okay. Uh. So there's the curve. So it doesn't seem to be doing anything, so let me just double check and make sure things are set as they should be. Check my hair system. Oh, sorry, my nucleus node. So I've got gravity, I've got wind. possible that I'm having weird interaction between um, this curve and other curves that are in the scene because I've created this so many times now. So I'm just going to delete a bunch of things. I'll leave my nucleus node, but I'll delete my other things, I think. There we go. So I think it's because I created another hair in exactly the same position before and they were colliding with each other. So there's my dynamic curve. I turned its um, uh, bend resistance way down. So let's see where we control some of these things before I go too much farther. So again, follicle three is the one we're working on. This is where we can control that the wet end is locked. So we change that to base can change a few other things here, but for now we're not going to really um, do anything with this. These are some of the older settings for uh, setting the quality of the hair. But we want to look at hair system shape here. This is number four in my case. And you can see under dynamic properties we can change things like stretch resistance, compression resistance, and bend resistance. Now, bend resistance is at zero, which is why it's just flopping down like this. So I can change this to one. And play the animation. You can see it bends, but not quite in the same way. Right? And then there are other things that you can change here, but for the most part, that's all we really need to look at. There's also a stiffness scale which controls how stiff it is from the base going up to the top. So you can add another point. So you can change the value over the length of the curve. But we'll just leave it like that for now. What we might want to change are things like the damp or the drag. So this will be sort of just turning down the amount that it, uh, that it moves in response to uh, forces in the world or changes of motion of, of the object. So if I turn damp up to one and play back the animation, you can see that it doesn't, it goes much more slowly in its bend. I'll change that back to zero. Let's try drag and see what that does. Is that to one? It's probably going to be way too much. So that will probably have more to do with its change uh, when we move it through the scene because there's drag through the, the density of the air.
So let's just leave it as is for now. So we have to do a couple other things. How do we make sure it stays with this object? If we move the, the root now, or the feet, you can see that the curve stays behind. Um, what you need to do for that is to take the follicle and make it a child of the root. So you can just take this hair system follicles and just middle mouse drag it to the root. So what you're dragging there is the non-dynamic curve. You can see the dynamic curve is still free out here. But the dynamic curve will try and follow the non-dynamic curve. And in fact, if we go back to hair system 4, you, there's a useful attribute here called attraction. Uh, the attraction sc stale, uh, scale and start curve attract. So if you wanted this to go from being dynamic, if you wanted to make sure it was straight up and down, you could animate this value and it would be attracted to the exact shape of the start curve. Okay. So now if we move the root, you can see that the curve follows. But you can see that the feet don't follow, so how do we move this whole monstrosity around? Well, that's where the mommy node comes in, the secular mommy node. So in this case, we'll create another curve, or sorry, another circle. And make it bigger. And I'll just change its shape a little bit, just so it's easily identifiable. We have something, whatever. And we'll call this, we'll call it main control. And what we want to do now is make all of these little circles, the foot controllers, and the root a child of the main controller. Now this is where my notes end, and I know there is... So there's one other thing I'm going to do first. I think I want to separate out the, the root. I don't want to attach the root directly to it. So I'm going to create another controller for root. And this is where I'm going to use a constraint, I think. I'm just going to create a polygon. I should really save this. Time. I've been going all morning. Okay, so I'm going to create a cube instead of a circle. And I'll just move this up to, so it's coincident with the root controller, or sorry, the root. And I'll just kind of scale this up. You know, something like this, something that I can easily grab. But this is not going to be, a, we don't want this to be a renderable object, it's just a something we can select, so we'll change some of its settings. Oops, geometry turned off. So if I go into the polycube shape, I go to object display, drawing overrides, I can enable overrides and turn off shading, so it'll always appear as a wireframe even if my scene is shaded. And under, in the same area, we've got render stats, which we've looked at before and we can just turn off everything. We don't want to be able to render this thing. It's just going to be a thing that we can grab and move around. Now I want the root to be a child of this thing. I think I'm going to use a constraint instead. Why? I'm not sure. So we'll call this root controller. And we'll select that and then we'll shift select the root node this one, and we'll create a parent constraint. And we want to make sure maintain offset is turned on, because we're controlling the translation and rotation, and we don't want the root controller's rotation to leap to, the, to match the rotation of this cube. We just want it to maintain this relationship. So with maintain offset turned on, it will just remember this relationship. 
So I've done that. Nothing bad happened. So you get double transforms if you scale it? Yeah, and yeah, that's right. I mean, if you want to scale up your rig, then you can scale this up uh, or scale up the, uh, yeah. So now if I select it, you see it turns all purple. Now I can move this and do a hold down. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and now you can see that this is controlling rotation too because it's a parent constraint which has point and rotation. And yeah? Can you explain what you did with the constraint again? Say that again? Sorry. Can you expl explain what you did with the constraint? Yeah, so anytime you want to constrain something, you select um, the object that will be constrained last. So in this case, the root is being constrained to match the motion and rotation, or the movement and rotation of this box that we've created. And so we select the box, and then we select the root, shift select the root, and then do a parent constraint with maintain offset turned on. So now we just want to parent all of these little feet controllers and the root controller to the main controller. So root controller, we'll just middle mouse drag it onto here. And then all the little feet will drag onto the main controller as well. So that means if we select the main controller and move it around in our scene, everything follows. So this is what you can use to animate it around or move it to its starting position, but you're still free to move these other things because they are the children of the main controller. And similarly, we can move the feet around to do things like that. So now let's, the last thing to do is test our little dynamic neck. Let's name my new band, dynamic neck. So we just want to animate this thing. So let's see. So let's translate that. So we can set a key here, and then maybe over 100 frames. No, maybe fewer, just 50 frames or so. We can drag it over here. Now let's see if this does anything. Ah, so we forgot to set the spline IK. Okay. Oh. Right. So we'll break connection. So now that's the last thing we have to do. I'm just going to play my animation so I can see that curve. So I can see that curve. Check my nucleus node again. Make sure there's nothing else interfering with this. Okay, hold on a sec. Just gonna hide the non-dynamic curve. So I don't select the back and I'll just try and make that IK handle again. So the reason that I'm not seeing it. There it is. Okay, so all right, skeleton, IK spline handle. So we need to select the root. No, nope, not that one. Not the root, sorry, the first spine. The end, and then this curve in the middle. There we go. So now, we can test this using the interactive playback too. We don't even have to set um, keys right now. So if I go to um, end solver, here I can use interactive playback. Start playing the animation, and nothing will happen. Huh. So, 
So it was the dynamic curve that I thought I selected the dynamic curve, but maybe I didn't. I hid the other curve. Let me just delete that. I select this curve in the middle. Okay, we need some weirdness. So it's that curve that we need. Yeah, we're having some, you can see it's disappearing when I'm doing this. So I'm just going to save this file and then I'm going to quit Maya and open it up again. Awesome. Yep. Um, the, the circles and the FC handles, mm -hmm. do they also need a root under the root? Yeah, so the, all the FC controllers, those little circles, should be children of the root. Okay. Um, as should the root controller. So that's the dynamic curve, which is what we want. Let's see if it's acting in a dynamic way. Not really. Point plot phase. Let me open up an earlier version when it's working so we can see. So this one has a has the same thing set up. So let's see if it's in a, it's hard to tell. Nope. That's it. So this should work. No, nope, it's not working. Well, it will work, I promise you, if you set it up yourself. So you really just need to, uh, when you finalize this, Create a spline IK with the base of the spine, the top of the spine, and make sure you select the dynamic curve and it will respond. I'm not sure why mine is not. Nope. I even have the wind speed turned way up and it's not reacting to that either. But now that we have this all set up, I'll stop now before I go on to uh, the last part which is binding it to geometry. You can see I've got geometry here, um, but I'll give you some time to try and set up the rest of this. But we've got something that will gives us all the control we need to animate the individual elements, as well as move it around the scene. Later what we can do is animate this thing descending and having another, uh, it's piercing needle come out too, but we won't do that today. You can see that it does what we want. But the, the real benefit of doing something like this is um, you're making something that does what you need to do, but no more. So you don't um, overextend its abilities and maybe break the controller. So with something like this, I could even, maybe I've done this already, um, set an attribute 
here. Can I do this? No. I can set an attribute here that will control the movement of this up and down. So this is as far down as it can go, and this is as far up as it can go. So it's just a single slider, so I don't accidentally animate it going like this or like this, which will start to break the rig or make it act in a strange way. Okay, so I can see a lot of you have started this already, so I'll just end this part now and let you continue trying to build the rest of it, and I'll put the other video up.